Well, this is the fourth Sunday in Advent, and some of us are left scratching our heads and asking, how did we get here so quickly? For others, it can't come soon enough. Either way, here we are, only two days away from our almost magical candle lighting as we raise our lights and sing joy to the world, the Lord has come. During Advent, among other things, we've considered two things each week. Number one, our Advent theme throughout has been it's time to wake up. We're reminded that we live in what can be a dark world, and we are invited to take up the true light. And number two, we heard again that Advent is not intended to be a pregame warm-up for Christmas. The word Advent is actually derived from the Latin word adventus, mean, meaning coming. Advent is a time of preparation for the coming and the arrival of God incarnate, incarnate Emmanuel. Historically, it's been a time of penance and prayer and fasting to prepare for this coming celebration of Christmas. Advent is to Christmas much like Lent is to Easter. And there's wisdom in postponing the cookies and the carols and the cards until we've had time to fully prepare for the significance of God with us. And I can't believe I'm saying that because I'm one of the first people to tune in to Christmas carols. But it is important to prepare. And so we've been very careful these four Sundays to try to take the time to prepare for the season. The first week we look specifically at true peace as we live in the light of God turning swords into plowshares. Week two was about true hope, hope based not on wishing, but on what we deeply hope God can do with us. Last week we looked at true joy, not found in stuff, but in God and community and in ourselves. And this morning, it's all about love, the power of true love. For me, one of the best parts of ordained ministry is officiating a wedding. We meet with a couple about four times beforehand and use a guide for a number of topics that are really important to talk about. We are able to speak and listen frankly and get to know one another, and of course, there's the wedding to plan. Early in my career at the rehearsal, the day before a wedding, the couple suggested that I might want to emulate a priest in their favorite movie. I had never heard of The Princess Bride, <laughs> but you can bet that I watched it in an effort to better hone my officiating skills. <laughs> See what you think. This is just kind of back up to, <laughs> there we go. I don't think I could ever pull off those mutton chops. <laughs> but it did surprise that couple the next day when I began the marriage ceremony with, marriage is what brings us together today. <laughs> the words, but not the accent. So for those who haven't seen the movie, the major theme is love. In fact, love totally drives the action of the whole story. It's based on the deep love between Buttercup, who was the bride at the altar, and Wesley, the farmhand, who incidentally is not the groom standing next to her. That's Prince Humperdinck, who was smitten by the lovely Buttercup and was forcing her to marry him. 
And just outside the chapel at the very end, in the darkness, Wesley and crew were ready to stop the wedding at all expenses. So we have love, a forced love, not a true love. And we have a dark world with violence and chaos beyond the walls of the castle. You know, real life can be like that. There is darkness. It's been a tough year as we have experienced division and exclusion at many levels. All is not well when the threat of gun violence in our schools make children fearful, when people go hungry with no roof over their head to keep them dry and warm, without benefits of basic medical care. And the environment is suffering each and every day as we watch species disappear from this planet and the water levels rise, threatening the well-being of those who live on the margins. And on a personal level, we've all experienced upheavals and at times carry the weight of fractured relationships, financial pressures, physical illnesses, and the frustrations of life out of control. And at the very least, this time of year is a time of tremendous expectations and sometimes a way in which shopping and cleaning and cooking and wrapping and card addressing and visiting can drain us more than fill us. We expect a picture-perfect Christmas. Expectations can be exhausting, and we're not feeling the love like we wish we would. And so we turn to Scripture, to a very familiar story, to see if we can find some new meaning, some new inspiration, and what light it can shed as we think about the power of true love. From Matthew 1. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations and with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus. This scripture serves to remind us that the preparations for the first Christmas were anything but conventional and were far from proper. There had to be extreme turmoil in the Holy fam Family. Think for a moment about the distress that this must have consumed both Joseph and Mary, and her whole family upon learning that Mary was pregnant. Engagement meant something very different in those days. The bond between Mary and Joseph at this time was contractual, not merely social like our understanding of what it means to be engaged today. The ancient world was immensely serious about betrothal. Legally, a couple was considered bound to one another and there was no way to easily unbind. While they had not yet moved in together or consummated their union, they were, for all intents and purposes, married. And according to the Hebrew scriptures, a pregnancy at this time was considered adultery, a crime punishable by death for the woman, most likely death by stoning. By the time of Jesus' birth, it appears that some of the religious requirements surrounding infidelity may have eased up some, and punishment by death was most likely replaced by a formal public renunciation of the woman, a ritual that would have shamed and shunned her and her whole family for life. The implications for Mary were clear. And then there's Joseph. We don't know a lot about Joseph, who was thought to have died by the time Jesus began his public ministry. In scripture, Jesus is referred to as the carpenter's son on at least one occasion. So it seems that somebody looked at Jesus and recognized something of Joseph. We do know something about Joseph's character. 
When Mary is found to be pregnant, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. Even before the angel appeared to Joseph in a dream, Joseph did something unexpected and unconventional. He resolved to bend the rules, and he did what flew in the face of the expectations of that day. He resolved to stand aside quietly and to leave Mary and her family with their dignity intact. Joseph followed the pull of something else. He heard the call of something deeply countercultural for a man in his situation. And here's the remarkable thing. For someone about whom we know so little, Joseph had the wisdom, the courage, the boldness to follow that call. Joseph didn't know that Christmas was right around the corner, but I think that he did hear the call of Advent. He heard its quiet, insistent longing for light to shine into the dark corners of the world, a world where love dares to speak its name, a world in which the greatest power is true love, true love in the form of Emmanuel, God is with us. The love that Jesus taught, the love he stood for, the love he was killed for, was just that kind of non-abandoning, instinctive, sheltering, protecting, guiding love. That kind of patient, quiet, healing love. That's the love of Jesus. And the love of his father, Joseph. And that's the love of God. That is the power of true love. Joseph didn't send Mary away full of shame. They married, they made their home and family, and the rest is history. For Joseph to hear the call of God's love was the dawn of a distinctly countercultural decision and vision. It is, if, as we said, Advent is about waiting, it calls us to let that true love of God to free our souls, like Joseph's, to envision the shadowy outline of a new world that is just beginning to dawn. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, we must discover the power of true love, the redemptive power of true love, and when we do that, we will make of this old world a new world, for love is the only way. Advent calls us to remember the love of Jesus and Joseph and the love of God, it calls us to let God's true love gradually take root deep in our being, freeing us for new expectations and the birth of something within us and for us, the arrival of Emmanuel. God is with us. God comes to us as we are, not as we should be or are trying to be or have promised to be or someday will be. God comes to us as we are today, this moment, and that, I believe, is the promise at the heart of Joseph's story. God came to Joseph and Mary at the birth of Christ. And in a similar way, God also comes to us through Jesus. John Pavlovitz is an author, pastor, blogger, and activist. And we hope to engage him here in the months to come, so stay tuned. In the Advent devotional that he wrote for this season, he says something like, I simply want my presence on this earth to result in less, less pain, less inequality, less poverty, less suffering, and less damage for those sharing it with me. I want the sum total of my minutes and my efforts to yield more compassion, more decency, more laughter, more justice, more goodness. In other words, he says, I just want to do love right. Emmanuel, God is with us. God is really with us, and we too can do love right. I had the delight and honor of hearing Episcopal Bishop, Bishop Michael Curry preach in Washington, D.C. in a conference that I was attending. Later that summer, he was also the guest preacher at the uh, Royal British, British Wedding, where he wowed the world with a message of love, of true love. 
I'd like to share a few of his thoughts in that message with my own spin. Imagine this tired old world where true love is the way. When true love is the way, no child will go to bed hungry ever again. When true love is the way, poverty will become history. When true love is the way, the whole earth will be a sanctuary. When true love is the way, we will lay down our swords down by the riverside. When true love is the way, we will treat each other kindly and with respect. When true love is the way, we know that God is creator of all and that we are brothers and sisters, God's family. That's a new human family, a new heaven, a new earth, and a new world. The power of true love, stronger than any darkness or power. Yes, this is Emmanuel. God is with us. This is true love in flesh and blood. Let every heart prepare him room. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen.